My name is Jamie Monroe. I know you all know that because you're here already, but uh, Jam Free Sports presents this coaches training program in Inner Circle. And really what, what this is going to be all about is, um, you know, a quick little introduction, and then it's going to be a lot of really cool content about the four coaching secrets. And then we're going to talk a little bit more about um, our program. So um, let's just get started here. So first of all, who is this for and what is it all about? Um, this I, I made this, including this, this program as well, the coaches program as well as the coaching secrets. I, and even the video that you saw, I've wanted this to be interesting enough for a division one coach, totally practical and useful for a high school coach. And, and from a philosophical perspective, if you're a youth coach, like you can use these concepts. Um, the combination of cutting edge and practicality is something that I've really been like thinking about and it's a goal of this whole program. And in the end, you know, I don't know about you, but I'm always looking for something, anything. And to add to your arsenal, uh, your drill bank, your playbook is something that I'm really hoping to do. Um, but to start here, um, I really do want to talk about Dave Huntley. So Hunts and I were working on this program together. Uh, Dave and I became, we, we became friends 10 years ago. I, I called him out of the blue and, and, and instantly it was like we were great friends. And we talked for two hours about like leaners or something. <laughs> And Gary Gate um, and how he shoots and like the guy literally had an insatiable appetite for talking about lacrosse but more importantly he was just the most amazing guy funny thoughtful uh, empathetic loyal you know, the kind of guy that made me feel better every single time uh, I needed to feel better and he made me want to do better I was his uh, defensive coordinator last year for the Atlanta Blaze and um, at the conclusion of the summer I was telling him what I was up to and I was planning on doing this program and um, he he basically was like, I'd be really interested in doing this. And so in November and December, we were on the phone a couple hours a day, five in the morning. I get up early. So, and I wanted to catch him before his real day job started. And we would talk and talk and argue. And Dave was the kind of guy that like literally would go off on a tangent. If you'd be, you'd be have like an agenda of like, all right, we got to cover these six things today. And we wouldn't cover any of them because we'd like literally start talking about, you know, how players are, uh, if players were dogs, what species would they be? So, uh, what, 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 what breed? So, like the, the guard dogs would be like the defensemen, and and like the uh, the labs, you know, would be like the the D middies. And it was just absolutely hysterical to like have him. And he was so he was like had to be brilliant because he knew so much about so many things. So, we're gonna miss Dave Huntley. Uh, love you, buddy. And um, you know, we'll uh, you'll be remembered and never forgotten. Um, it's what you learn after you know it all that counts. I always thought this, this was a really interesting quote from John Wooden. And, 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 and think about this, and I know this is true with me, through all the stages of my coaching career, I, I usually thought I was pretty well prepared and I'd studied hard and I knew what I was doing. But in every one of those stages, if I looked back five years, I'd be like, I had no idea what I was doing. I was like clueless. Uh, what was I thinking? And that's just kind of the progression of life. And I think what's cool about this quote is it's, what it's all about is just a, a, you know, continuing to learn and focusing on that. And that's really what we're trying to do here. Um, as far as this presentation, if you didn't know, if you, if you hit shift command and three, you can screenshot on, a, on, a, on an Apple anyways, you can take a screenshot like you would on your phone. So if you wanna like screenshot anything, any slides or whatever, like I said, I'm, I'm gonna be sharing this presentation with you later. Um, there are some like, when I, when, when I say I'm sharing some of my most guarded secrets, I, I guess that's relative to when I was actually like coaching and I didn't want, you know, the, uh, the coach at Arapahoe or something to know what I was doing. Um, and, um, like I would tell a division one coach, if I was going to, I was going to call up Lars Tiffany and be like, Hey, I got a player for you. I, I would expect this. I, I, he, I don't expect him to take the kid, but I expect him but, but I wouldn't be telling them if it wasn't interesting. And that's why I want to show you guys what I'm up to, because I think you're going to find what, what, we're, what I'm doing here pretty cool. So really quick, um, I, I've coached at virtually every single level, which I think really is going to be helpful for me to be able to help you in this. I mean, I, I spent 20 years coaching college lacrosse and was a head coach at Denver and went to a couple of NCAA tournaments, had a couple of top 12 finishes, um, have just been a, a student in this game forever. But but I've coached pro lacrosse, I've coached high school, I've coached youth. Um, I founded and ran 3D lacrosse for eight years and understand the whole world of club and coaching. And, you know, you name it, I've probably done it. And um, 
And in the end, I think that what I'm going to try to do is just share my experiences. And like I keep saying, I'm trying to make this combination between cutting edge and practicality uh, that I think is going to be um, pretty cool. So a lifetime of lacrosse is what I'm sharing with you. I've, I've really been lucky and I, I, I consider myself blessed to be able to like, as soon as I got out of college, I went to Australia and played lacrosse. And then I coached at Colorado College, coached at Yale, coached at Denver, started 3D, coached high school. And, 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 and every time I was going to do something new, I, it just came back to lacrosse. And that's what I'm doing now. And I, I literally have had the privilege and, and, and I've been lucky enough to think about it all day and figure out a way to like, make a living at it. And I'm really psyched to share that with you guys. Um, and um, one of the philosophies I've always had is, is the, the concept of paint your own picture. When I got to Denver, I literally had a, an office in, in, a, in a defunct dining hall in a dorm. It was like a ghost dining hall. And I was in cubicles. And I shared a cubicle with my assistant in a ghost dining hall. But yet, we, we just attacked it like we were going to be. I was like, we're going to be in the Final Four within four years. You know, I mean, or five years. You know, in five years, we actually did, like, win a league championship. Um, but but um, I think it's just kind of the attitude of thinking big time. I always think about developing the best players in the world. Always. I'm like, I look at what the best players in the world do, and I'm like, you know what? We can do that. Kids can do that. We can teach that. Um, and when you think about your teams or your camps or your brand, meaning your, you know, your name or whatever it is that you're doing, the brand of your school, you know, I mean, you got to think of your school as a brand. I did. You know, uh, I, 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 when, I, when I got to Mountain Vista High School, I was like, we're going to be nationally competitive and nationally known, and we want to win it all. Um, and so when you start thinking about painting your own picture, and thinking big, it's a mindset. And that's part of what I want to help out with uh, as it relates to this. And a couple more slides before we get into it. But why are we here? Well, just like me, you love lacrosse. Or you wouldn't be here, guaranteed. And, you know, the process, it, everything is a process. I don't care whether you're a rookie head coach or whether you've been doing it forever. It's a process. And we embrace it. And we know that we, we live for this process. We know that a lifetime of learning is just part of the joy of it. Like, how cool is it when you learn something, you know, and you're like, that is so awesome. And I, usually I'm like, I can't believe I didn't think of this earlier. And speaking of aha, speaking of that, many of the aha moments we've ever had, I, I, that I've had anyways, I'm like, I already knew that. Like, why is this an aha moment now? I, I learned this 10 years ago. Um, but it takes time to click. And I think that's another reason why we're all on this quest. Um, and then the other thing is we're asking our players to get better every day. And that's what we do. And that's why we're here. So let's get started on, on this uh, little uh, coaching presentation. Um, I think you're going to like this. The, the first thing I want to talk about is how to create a culture of ball movement. And um, really what, what that means is that, you know, when you see teams with great ball movement, you're just like, man, like that, that, that is, there's so much skill on that team. There's so much IQ. Uh, there's so much, um, there's just like so much um, um, great coaching. And you, you sort of look at all this stuff and it, it starts with fundamentals. Um, no cradle or one cradle. Um, Claremont rules. It, it starts with like one more, one more pass. Emphasizing hockey assists, ground ball offense. These are all things that we're going to talk about right now. But to start, I, I found this clip that I want to share with you guys that's uh, really cool. Last season's Golden State Warriors assisted on 70.5% of their field goals, the highest rate of the last 13 years. The Warriors have enough talent to rank as a top five offensive team without much cohesion, but their ball movement makes the most of that talent and is a big reason why the champs set records for the highest effective field goal percentage and the most points per 100 possessions in NBA history. Almost every player shoots better off the catch than off the dribble. And in moving from the Thunder to the Warriors, the percentage of Kevin Durant's jumpers that were off the catch increased from 36% to 46%. He went from the team that ranked last in passes per possession to the team that ranked 10th, even though the Warriors had the league's shortest possessions on average. Their unselfishness started in transition, where they ranked fourth in the league in pass events. And it continued in clutch situations as their assist rate with the score within five points in the last five minutes was higher than the overall assist rate, 28 of the other 29 teams. The Warriors have set the standard for teamwork, and it's scary to think that in Durant's second season with the team, 
it could have better chemistry on both ends of the floor. You know, when you think about, and, and some of you have probably done this, but if you haven't, Google Steve Kerr and the Warriors and, and look at the way that they've decided to make passing and pass counts. Um, and, and, and this NBA analytics with pass aheads and assisted baskets and assisted baskets in crunch time and clutch time. These are the things that um, are, are, are about creating a passing culture. And, you know, to have a team that passes like this, that moves the ball, it's a mentality as well as a skill level, the mentality of unselfishness, moving the ball off the ground, looking for giving goes. Um, these are the things that, like, honestly make a massive difference in your game, and you can absolutely do this. But it starts with fundamentals. You can't get away from this. And, and you know, when I started at Mountain Vista High School, we were not a very skilled team. And we did this drill, whether it was two-man or three-man, no weave, three-man weave. We literally did this for an hour every single day. And there, there is no escaping it. I don't care how good you are. The ability to throw and catch on the run at speed, one cradle, look up the field and move the ball is usually the way we sort of talk about this. Um, and, you know, it, honestly, it's kind of funny, but if it's like all you did, you'd actually be pretty good. Another, another drill I, I, I picked off from um, the University of Denver, Matt Brown does this drill, and I love it. And it's called crank passing, and it's where you just shoot the ball at each other. And you don't have to do this for very long. You do it for a few minutes. Um, but the ability to, to catch balls that are coming at you that hard, to shoot balls that are coming at you. By the way, if you're a coach, do not go anywhere near this drill. you got to stay on the end zones of this drill because you can, like, literally lose your life if you try to, like, get in the middle of it and start coaching. But I, I can tell you, when we started doing this drill, we saw results immediately in the way our guys moved the ball. And, you know, I talk to Nick Myers a lot. Here's some, an Ohio State clip. He is so big, and he calls it singles when he moves the ball on one pass. He doesn't want skips. He wants singles. And he wants, he wants fast ball movements. And he wants – oh, sorry about that. And he wants um, – hold on, let me just unmute this. Um, he wants singles. He wants one cradle or no cradle. And he does a ton of drills involved moving the ball this quickly. Part of it is the pocket you play with. Part of it is the way you're coached. But it doesn't happen by mistake. And I'll tell you this, when you start practicing in this way, all the, you know how you pick up your kid's stick sometimes and you're like, oh my God, how do you throw with this stick? When you play with these types of drills with your three man on the run and, and your crank passing and that stuff, they can't have a whip. So then when you start playing in these situations where you're just banging the ball really fast, you, you can tell there's no whips on these sticks, but it's part of the, it's not just part of the culture, it's part of the, the environment that you're setting and the environment that you're creating um, creates this. Um, in Canada, you're going to see so much quick passing, no cradle, reversals, skips across the crease, back up. Um, and, and this is like an outdoor box up in um, a couple intermediate level kids up in British Columbia. And these kids – you know, who knows who they are? Uh, the, Coach Doddridge is, was, was putting this together for me. But at the end of the day, banging the ball in four on threes and just making no cradle rules will significantly help you. Now, there's a, there's a drill called Claremont. Some of you probably know it. This is the Coquitlam Adanax midget team, 15 and 16 year olds, playing a four on four Claremont rules drill. And what is Claremont? It's a two to three second rule with the ball and a give and go. And, and, and when I think of the most fundamental things, Claremont's one of them. And, and what is Claremont? Claremont is a secondary school in Victoria, BC. Watch this give and go right here. Claremont is a run. Darren Rising, a former, uh, a former uh, star at, um, on the Victoria Shamrocks and the Team Canada runs this school, and their whole offense, the Claremont School, is geared on this two to three second rule with the ball and a give and go. And I can tell you, there's not a more impactful environment to put your players in that scales passing and off ball movement, not just because of the give and go, but because of that everybody else has to move to support the ball when you have that type of 
um, two to three second rule with the ball. I love this drill. Pass down, pick down, and pass down, pick away, three on twos might be the best way to scale the one more ever. Watch the passing out of these eighth graders. Pass down, one more. We get the one more call. Pick away, pass across, their heads are up. Sometimes that's a shot, sometimes it's a one more. But, you know, for me personally, I can't take watching bad lacrosse, but I can watch plays like that all day. Ground ball offense. You know, we all do ground ball drills. But, you know, when you pick up the ball, you got to move it. The defense is getting extended. Move the ball as quickly as you can and then move it again. And then you're going to be able to figure out a way to attack. And this is exactly what Carolina did on this. The little uh, triple hitch here was special. But the ground ball and the quick ball movement is what made it happen. And you got to do this in all of your drills. So if you're running a five-on-four scramble drill, pick it up, move it, move it again, fire your passes. That's a crack pass right there. Of course, you didn't handle it, but it's okay. The culture of moving the ball off the ground is, you know, if you're doing ground ball drills and people are jogging it in, you're missing the point on ground balls. And you can see our defense is doing a pretty good job of pressuring because they know we want to move it. So the ability to get the ball off the ground, to move it quickly, get it to the other side of the field is really what the whole game is about. And, and when we talk about a passing culture and scaling passing, um, all of these things, these little tricks of the trade will make a massive difference in your team. And you just have to think about scaling this at all times. Um, comes down to fundamentals first and, and then down to these types of drills. Um, the second thing we're going to talk about is practicing uneven drills as if they were all even. And I, I consider this like maybe the ultimate secret sauce. I mean, you know, honestly, I, I think this is the secret sauce behind the growth of 3D lacrosse. We were able to teach coaches how to teach skill and concepts together in a way that was uh, amazing. And, and it really created a pretty consistent brand of lacrosse. But let's look at something. What's the common myth number one? Never dodge when you're man up. Have you ever heard that? Yeah, well, it's probably true. We don't want to really want to like run a double mumbo when, when we're uh, on EMO. But just because it's three against two doesn't mean we don't want to simulate all even. Why do we love odd man drills anyways? We love them because it, it allows us to get a one more and a finish. And we love that. But if you don't move, it just really gets stale and you don't get as much out of it. And, and the last thing here is what if I told you that in this one model, you could teach every single skill and every single movement. So this is how it's done, whether it's two on one through six on five. Initiate your drills with one on ones, with, with the defender right on the dot with the defender right on the dodger. And make the dodger initiate a dodge, not just move it right away because there's open people. We know there are open people. It's three against two. Make them initiate a dodge and, and, and then go from there. Make them dodge with their head up. Make them, in, make them execute a particular dodge. Make them pass with a pole on, on their hands. And then, and then we can initiate a movement or a motion. By the way, how many movements are there? How many off-ball movements are there? You know, you can always count them, all right? So you can, you can clear through, you can shallow cut, you can fade, um, you can pick for the ball, you can pick away, you can cut the middle. Um, you know, there's all kinds of like crease cuts. Um, but in the end, there really aren't that many actual pure movements. There's a lot of motions. That's a little different because there's more numbers, but out of pure movements. And you can do all of them. You can do two on one, shallow cut. You can do three on two, dodge, fade, cut the middle. You can do four on three, pass down, pick down, ball side, up, pick, backside. And so by doing all of that, you are also layering on skills but one of the most important things you have to remember when you're doing your unevens this is critical is, is the defensive emphasis if you don't emphasize ball pressure and i mean pressure rotate if you i see so many coaches or so many players teams they do like a five on four drill and there's like this tight box and these guys are packing it in 
and no one's rotating, nobody's moving, everything's being passed off, that's not going to make either side of the ball that much better. Even though it might be a strategy to pack it in, we're talking about developing multiple things at one time. So we want to have ball pressure, off ball stance, communication, rotation, slide and recover. So think about what it would be like if your players knew a ton of movements. Uh, you pick on the ball, backdoor cut, up and over, pick across, slip, dodge, exchange behind, clear backdoor cut to clear some space for an invert, invert and have some good spacing. This type of movement can all be done in your three on twos, swing pick, midfield exchange, crease float, backside guy cut, pass across, the pick again. And then you've got space for a dodge and a redodge. These all of these movements can be worked on in three on two and four on three. So the way we'd like to do it, this is a, an awesome drill called the Buckeye Build-Up. You've probably all seen it. It's a two on one that builds up, but as soon as we get past two on one, we turn it into carry, shallow cut. Carry, shallow cut, move it, play out of it. It's way more dynamic for the both sides of the ball. Get the ball off the ground, move it quickly. Carry, shallow, move it. Yeah, these kids are kids. They're going to drop the ball, but we're still going to play out of it. Now it turns into a five against four. The ball gets off the ground quickly. Carry, shallow. Nothing open. Pass. Carry, shallow. We move it. Heads are up. This is how you create. This is how you work on skill and concept at the same time. I know we saw this clip already, but I have to show it again. I showed this to you in the uh, perfect, in the, uh, in the um, greatest offense video. But this is the perfect example of where an uneven drill can be. You can work on everything. So here we are in our offense. Reverse it out top. Reverse it. I want you to split. I want you to reverse pull pass. Step in, draw one more. Backside wind up. Skip. Multiple hitch move into an anti-leaner shot. You can script this for your players. But by the way, we are working on the midfield motion that we would call regular, a dodge, a follow, and a float. And we're working on all of these different skills with everybody, teaching our attack and our middies how to play all of the motions. And this is kind of why our teams got learned all the skills, because they could, at the end of the day, they learn how to drag, move it, skip, shoot, all these different skills. And I love saying killing three birds with one stone. Part of the art of coaching is killing three birds with one stone at times. Hey, listen, sometimes it's really important to just focus on one bird. If you try to do two or three birds during a, during a defensive uh, you know, stance drill, you're going to lose out on – you're not going to get your defensive stance that you want. But when you're doing a three-on-two drill, like three-on-two, and you want to work on you know, a three-on-two weave, you know, you're going to be able to work on a split dodge, a fade, um, the fakes, the one-mores, final pass, twisters, behind the back fake. I think it was an around the world fake. And you can, you can script all of this stuff within your, within your off, within your unevens. And, uh, you know, if you never have motions on your unevens, um, what are you actually working on? Man up. It just doesn't work out that you're man up that much. You might as well teach motions and you might as well teach your defense how to pressure motions and really rotate. Here in a four on three drill, you can work on your pairs offense, pass down, pick down, ball side, cup in middle and cycle backside. Look for your nation's look. I mean, these looks are 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 there in the skill building, the pressure. Look at look at how our the defenders actually are fighting through the pick here. They're not passing it off. They're staying through it. If they had to switch, they might have. But I say, hey, push through that pick, and let's play this like it's all even. Essentially, we're simulating all even when it's uneven. How about flips? You know, like, would you like your team to be good at flips? You know, whether it's a fake flip on man up, a hidden ball trick, or something like this where it's kind of like a little weave type of play? Yeah, we would. Well, do, do two on ones. This is one of the best finishing drills there are. And you're going to start seeing, did you see that kid? He faked his flip with one hand. Let's look at that again. He faked his flip with one hand. The other kid pretended he had it. Oh, wait a minute. Sorry, guys. Try that over again. He fakes his flip with one hand. The other kid pretends he has it. And, and then all of a sudden, he draws and dumps. Has an opportunity for a little twister finish. 
these two on one drills, three on two, I love three on two flips because it creates so much ball movement. Flip, pass, pass, goal. Um, so there's, there's a lot of like just phenomenal stuff you can do within the scope. And again, the, the advantage, why is it a secret sauce? Because you can, you can really knock off so many things at one time. You can basically work on every single skill, every single movement, in every single motion while you're getting better at both man-to-man -man defense as well as man-down rotations. It's pretty awesome. So secret number three, the three stages of, do of the dodge. This is really interesting because, you know, when you think about dodging, and we do one-on-ones, and, and, uh, but, but if you always start from the beginning, you're, you're going to get more of that look, which is why most people are pretty good at their split dodge. But are they really good at the middle of the dodge or the end of the dodge? Um, if we can create different environments, it has a huge impact on both sides of the ball. You know, it's doing one-on-ones with pure speed, you know, no defense out there. It's, it's relatively easy for the offensive player. It's a lot harder when you have to start doing it in different situations and scenarios. Um, let's listen to Quint here talk about this. It's pretty apt for this discussion. If you're the other tackling, hit the DVR right now. You, you get a, a terrific – Exclamation point, a little question mark there. It's a left-handed drive to a right-handed shot. He curls it off, starts with a finalizer by a power move, and a right-handed jump shot. And I'll tell you why. That's Split, cut back, roll back, question mark. It's the beginning of the dodge was the split. The middle of the dodge was the finalizer roll back. The end of the dodge, that was the question mark. You have to practice these, these things individually at times. So many times people <laughs> kind of just do their one-on-ones like this. You know, it's just, let's just dodge and, and, and get a shot off. Um, the, uh, hold on. The, um, oops. Sometimes you do one-on-ones in which there's a pull on the ball and, and this player is not good enough to play against the pull. So you got to put a shorty on the ball if you want to develop everybody. And we don't really want to have – that many people in lines. I used to do four corners one-on-ones all the time, and then I just realized, like, man, we're not getting enough reps. So let's talk about the beginning of the dodge. What does that mean? Well, you can – how do you initiate? Off the wind-up, the catch, the wind-up. You can wind up off the bounce, too. You got V-cuts and split dodges. You got double threat dodges, which is kind of like Kyrie Irving style. And then you got your outside in dodges. If you watch Denver play, they do that a lot where they're – they move the ball across the top two passes, and the dodger starts his dodge before he gets the ball, and their passes are so good, they can zip it in there, and it really makes it hard on a recovering defender. But when you think about winding up, it's so critical. you got to practice your wind-ups so you can get screenshots off. you got to practice your wind-ups so you can, you know, hesitate. you got to be able to get double hitches. you got to be able to get face dodges. There's so many, like, you know, you got – Hitch and go, wind up, face dodge, face dodge, roll back, you know, all the rocker moves. There, there's a lot, there's a lot of moves that go along with it. But if you wait for these situations to happen, you might not get the chance. So why not do wind up one-on-ones? We do this all the time. We line the, we line the defender up in the crease with a tennis ball. We throw it out to the dodger. And the dodger has the opportunity to shoot a screenshot. Or, shoot, or, or dodge. you got to use tennis balls for this because because if you don't, you're going to kill somebody with a screenshot. And the screenshot, frankly, is like the whole key to the whole thing. If you're not getting the dodges that you want, start shooting screenshots and you'll get the dodges that you want, I guarantee. Now, you might have seen this because I put this in the last video, but this dodging technique is so important. It's called a slide dodge. And it allows you to get so close to your man and get his feet to stop that you can get a step that's, that's to the extent where you can get enough of a step that you can throw the ball to X with your inside hand and draw people. If you can do that, if you can dump the ball to X with your inside hand, you've really put yourself in a position to be able to um, create great offense for your team on getting that ball through X. And the hesitation stops their feet 
the how close you get is the entire key because they basically don't have any cushion left. And at the end of the day, if you're ever struggling to beat people, get close and do that, and you're going to be pretty happy with it. How do we teach this? This is how I do one-on-ones. I do four corners all at the same time. I got two cages going too. So we got 16 offensive players and we're working right now on jab stepping in our slide dodges. And in five minutes, we're getting more reps on both sides of the ball than we could get in 30 minutes of one-on-ones. And so to be able to, to be able to figure out how to work on these parts and also how to get more reps. And we all know there's just not enough time to do it. How are you going to learn all this stuff? You're not going to learn going one at a time. I'm telling you that for sure. The middle of the dodge, you know, the middle of the dodge is a fun part of the dodge. The change in direction, the rollbacks, cutbacks, stop and goes, rockers, hitches, pop out, Z dodge. There's a million. This is like, this is a brief list too. You know, physical dodging, initiating contact, trip moves. Um, the middle of the dodge is not more important, but it's a big part because you're just not going to beat people necessarily off your first dodge. So look at Peter Baum here in, in the MLL. Split dodge, roll back, slide comes, dodges it with a finalizer. That's a wing finalizer, basically. And it's he wouldn't have scored if he just had to take the, if he had to just make his first move on one shot. There's no way. Check this out. This is the original MJ move right here. MJ goes baseline left-handed. Oakley comes over. He dribbles away right-handed and then slams it on Patrick. This is the same redodge that's going to get you goals from the midfield. It's an MJ move, and it's named after that play. And still my favorite athlete of all time and maybe my favorite play he ever made. And MJ moves are pop away, fake, switch hands, reattack, keep faking, and redodge. That's really what it's all about. And we got to practice this. This is a, a drill that Jerry Byrne uses called DBR, and he does this. We did it primarily for our defense as well. To be honest, this is more of a defensive focus, but it was a dodge, a bounce, a re-dodge. And then if you watch, if you watch the, uh, the, the, the um, defenders, you got a slider who's like trying to guard a man. And why I love this drill for the defense is obviously because it's easy to slide the speed you got to be able to slide to redodges. But why I love it for the offense is they are looking at sliders. And, you know, there is no reason in the world that you should be looking at your man. you got to look at a slider. Now, I'm not letting them feed in this drill. Here we're doing the drill from behind with rollbacks. Well, I'm not letting the, the feeders feed because it's more of a defensive drill where they're going to have to fight through it. But their heads are up. They're dodging. They're looking, bouncing making their move, and they see they wouldn't be feeding if it weren't for the fact that their, their goal in this drill is to um, try to beat the guy. Hesitation moves, by the way. Um, I'll tell you what. I, I think hesitation moves are the coolest moves that there, that there possibly could be in the sport, in any sport. And when you watch Kyrie Irving, why does he hesitate so much? You know, his first hesitation there, his first hesitation, got him past his man. His second hesitation froze everybody else on the court. This is something that's kind of counterintuitive. But when you beat a man, the first thing you want to do is hesitate again. You're still going to retain your step. But, but if, you, if Kyrie tried to go to the rack from here, he'd get a shot blocked. He has to hesitate and look it off. And basketball players are brilliant at looking off what they're doing. Lacrosse players are brutal at looking off what they're doing. If you're going to the rack, you should be hesitating and looking it off. Turn your head, look back fake. If you want to feed it, make it look like you're going to the basket or the ba going to the goal. So in any case, um, pretty awesome to look at hesitations. They have to be practiced and worked on. Certain athletes are a little bit more understand it a little bit better than others. But this athlete right here understands it as well as Andy. Kevin Rice, watch the hesitations setting up his rollback. Why is this working so well? Notre Dame likes to fight through picks. So he's like hesitating on the way to this pick. Sorry. 
he's hesitating on the way to the pick, and he makes this guy overrun him, trying to fight through the pick. Kevin Rice is the best at that stick foot hesitation. He's hesitating on his left foot. It sets up his rollbacks. He makes people – Kevin Rice doesn't beat people with a faster change of direction. Kevin Rice beat people by making them overrun him with his change of speed. He changes speed, bursts, sells go. They got to change direction. They cannot keep up with him because they're overrunning him. You can do this off the windup, off the split, people anticipating your change of direction. It's subtle stuff. How do you practice this across the field? We have everybody working on it. You go back and forth a few times, working on hesitation, rollback. You can see that first kid forgot to roll back. He was a freshman. But everybody else is working on the feel of how to do a little rocker and a rollback, rocker and a rollback. And we would go back and forth. Everybody gets a chance on offense and defense, and it allows us to really get better at it. I put this in because it was I got a funny story about it. Um, there's a move called the trip move. I taught this move. This move was invented by Andy Towers back in the early, late 80s, early 90s. And I taught my son how to do this move. And when he was six years old, this is all he did. He would like trip. It didn't even matter if he was what sport he was playing. He would do this move. I finally had to like ban him from, from the trip move because he tripped so many people that it was like, it was actually like slowing down the rest of his development. But this is just simply a pop out. Paul Rabel does this. Not many people do. Jeff Snyder, who played for me, I taught this when I was at Denver. Um, I've never seen anyone get injured from it. But what it is, have you ever noticed that sometimes a defender falls down? You know how we're like, hey, if so-and-so falls down, what are we going to do? Well, why do people fall down? They fall down because sometimes offensive players inadvertently step into their feet when they're popping out. That's what a trip move is. So let's get into the end of the dodge scenarios. How do you get your shot off? Do you fake? Are you physical? And do you have a repertoire of ways to get your shot off? This move is one of my favorite moves going, the exaggerated rocker. Now, we've all known a rocker forever, but there's different. There's a quick rocker, and there's what I would call the exaggerated rocker. The subtlety on this one that is so interesting is watch this. Do you see how Kevin Rice basically lifts his stick up into a shooting position and makes Fletcher, an all-pro and, all and, and USA team defender, completely swing and miss? I didn't know that this was a technique. I don't know if he knows it's a technique. The funny thing is, is I was doing tight one-on-ones with my daughter, and she did. I was, like, doing exaggerated rocker, and she showed her stick the same way. You can learn from just watching and get the nuances. And I'm telling you, that'll work. How about this? I personally think the behind-the-back fake is one of the best fakes that there is in the sport. And I'll tell you why. Because when you fake behind the back, it basically makes people guard the wrong side of you. Or they, make you, they allow you to shoot. When I was talking about having people become the – trying to train people to be the best players in the world, why wouldn't you work on these things? You know, watch Eric Fennell for Ohio State last year. The guy would pull out skills. The Canadians pull out skills that the Americans won't. Why? Because they grow up doing it. How about this? Using your bottom hand with two hands on your stick to lift the other, your defender's stick. It's a ward, yeah. But it's not a ward with two hands on your stick. You can practice this, but you're never going to be able to practice it if you don't do tight one-on-ones. Tight one-on-ones are a drill that allow you to practice your squared up post-ups, your exaggerated rockers, your rip move, just like that. So we have to work on dodging from all these different areas. And we don't have to spend a long time. They don't need a million reps. We just need a few reps. And they're going to be able to do it. So the last thing I want to talk about is practicing pressure every day. You got to practice pressure. I don't care whether you want to, whether you got to, whether the team you have to beat loves to pressure or whether you want to pressure. You, or whether you're trying to kill a game because you're up by a goal and you got to deal with the pressure, 
or you got to get it back. You got to be able to double team. You got to be able to press out. You have to be able to rotate and you have to work on this stuff and you got to work on it every day, whether it's ball pressure, adjacent pressure, double teams, rides, shutoffs. The beauty of it, though, is we're not just talking about game preparation. We're talking about player development on both sides of the ball. And so when you get into a situation where the ball gets down to your lefty and all of a sudden they're going to say, hey, I don't think this guy can throw it right-handed, and they start putting pressure, you know how to go in and out. You can move the ball. Your shorties know to come out and set a pick in support. This drill right here is a drill that, you know, it, it's, nothing, it's nothing that original. But I do want to talk about the nuances of how to run it. This is a four-on-four four drill in which we're going to pressure adjacently in the direction the ball's going. So when you look at this in the beginning, we're going to pressure both adjacents right now. We haven't picked a side. So the adjacent that you can't see over here, the midfielder, he's being pressed out upon. But as soon as the, the midi picks a side, we're going to press on the adjacent that he's in. You should see a midi getting in right now. You don't because I think it's a freshman in there. And now you're seeing, okay, this attackman's trying to get open. He's locked. This attackman back here is making the read. And how important is that read to realize that someone's being pressured and I have to support the ball? And this defender guarding him was doing a pretty good job because he stayed in front of the goal. He's not, we're not doing a four-man shutoff drill. That's not going to help your team defense. But we're doing a pressure drill. And then we're going to try to skip that ball. Obviously, he made a poor pass left-handed or we made a bad catch. We play it right out. We keep going. And we would do this. you got to do this at least once or twice a week. And, again, you don't need a million reps at it. But if you don't work at prep, dealing with that pressure and applying that pressure, you're not developing your, your team the way you want to. Notre Dame, they're not known as a pressure team, but I'll tell you what, they can pressure. And here they are on man down, applying pressure. A great thing to do, a must to practice against. Denver does a pretty good job. Notre Dame settles in again, and all of a sudden they start getting the pressure on. They're rotating hard. They're in great position. And sometimes it just doesn't work out for you in the game. But at the end of the day, that pressure on both sides of the ball, I mean, I thought Notre Dame did an amazing job of applying the pressure and reapplying pressure, and I thought Denver did an amazing job of dealing with the pressure, and that doesn't come by mistake. That comes with work. Here's a really great way to pressure and deal with pressure. We did this last year on the Atlanta Blaze a ton, where when a long poles man would pick, we would jump the switch. We would jump switch. We would jump it like we were double teaming, but the shorty on the ball would go and quickly lock off the, the, the guy who was getting the pull. And then we could, put, we could apply pressure to a midi that wasn't used to having a pull on. In this case, seven is that shooter for Hopkins. He's, he's, not a, he's a lefty. He doesn't want the ball right here. And all of a sudden, he gets uh, taken advantage of by the Navy defender. But these are the types of things that will happen in games to you. Whether you want to apply the pressure or not, you have to be able to learn how to do this stuff. We all work on picking. But how often do we work on Jumping picks in our picking. The ability, I'm putting the volume up on this one. Let's, let's listen to this for a second. You probably can't hear that well, but you're going to hear stay left and stay right calls. And the reason why is because if you do this drill, you're going to see your offense like kill the defense at first. And the reason why they're going to kill the defense is because it takes legitimate coordination and communication to be able to double. And so if you try to do this drill, I'm going to tell you the whole key to doing this drill is doing it until you're good at it. You have to almost walk, you have to actually walk through it and you have to carry left here. Oops. Sorry about that. And you have to, carry the ball darn it you have to carry the ball and, and just walk through this because there's a defender here off the ball that has to be a he has to be tight to his man b he has to be talking to the man on the ball telling him hey joey get ready 
Pick's coming, pick's coming right. Get ready. And then he's going to say, stay left. Because that stay left call is going to tell that guy to stay on the double. These guys did a pretty good job on that double team. You're going to see the defenders behind, too. It's very hard to communicate. You should be saying right now, Simon, pick coming right. Pick coming right. Get ready. Get ready. Stay left. Stay left. Stay left. If you try to do that full speed, it's not going to happen. you got to do that literally in a walkthrough situation. The ball's coming. The pick's coming. you got to tell them to get ready. And then all of a sudden, stay left, stay right. It's so critical that you practice that. Now, this is the four-on-four -four version of that drill. I would tell you that if I was stuck on a desert island and I could only have one drill, this would be it. I sincerely believe this drill is the best drill at developing your entire team of any drill going. And here's why. It raises the tempo. It creates communication. It allows your offense to learn how to deal with pressure and make a pass. Now these two low guys, they were slow to rotate, but they have to learn how to rotate and rotate again. And these guys should be busting their tails in to recover. We could have rotated and recovered on this. And if you're, if this is early in the season, so we're not great at it yet. So we do one rep out top, then we do one rep behind. Hey, Judd, pick on the left. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Stay right, stay right. And they're going to try to pass their way out of it. So this drill makes you a better lacrosse team on both sides of the ball. It'll obviously, you know, if nothing else, you're going to have to learn how to be successful at the end of the game. And you can see right here, we've got a defender playing the ball, playing his man behind the net while he, we got a rotation. He could have easily been there, and we could have recovered on this thing. But this is what it's all about, you know. Whether it's high school lacrosse or college lacrosse, learning how to play fast, rotate fast, scramble, stay on doubles, and communicate is key. But remember, if you don't, this drill is the same as the two on two. If you're not good enough at this drill, then walk through it. Literally walk through it until you have the communication down. This communication that I just executed is hard as heck to do in real time. So, you know, in, in one hour, we don't have a lot of time. But I can tell you, if you thought there was like cool stuff on this video, then chat me. I'd be happy to, uh, you know, chat with you, chat, chat back or read it out, read out loud if I could just figure out a way to chat with you. But um, what I want to do now, if it's all right, is just go through this program. And, and, and I won't take too long with it, but I think you're going to find it incredibly cool and interesting. You know, like I told you, I've spent a lifetime trying to figure out how to coach this game and learn how to play it, man. I still love playing it, play pickup games. So this is the process we're going to go through. First, we're trying to lay the foundation. Um, for those of you who don't know, I, I, we've got um, coaching and leading to create a culture of success is the first topic of our webinar because you have to lay the foundation. Jim Stagnita is a uh, – you know, 30-year veteran of coaching Division One lacrosse, head coach at Rutgers, head coach at WNL, um, been in the NCAA tournament. He's now the head coach at um, for the Charlotte Hounds. The guy is like, you know, as experienced as anybody, and he's turned his attention working with his buddy J.C. Glick, a U.S. Army infantry officer, special operations and special missions unit guy, and they've got they're they're working with. Um, the uh, Carolina Panthers, they're working with, they had a meeting with the NFL, um, with, with like the NFL um, owners. They, they worked, they're working with Johns Hopkins lacrosse. These guys are the best at helping you build your culture. And it's going to be something, we're going to have them come back on. Um, but we also need to think about our full season plan. We have to evaluate who we are, you know, figuring out who you are and, and figuring out how to organize your practice plans and prioritization and gee, there's there's not enough time to get everything done um, we're going to go through the 15 drill foundation 
We're going to give you, you have to establish your own language, your own terminology. I, I am going to give you a terminology list, you know, take it for what it's worth. You can use it or not use it. You don't need to change your language on my account. That's for sure. But, but if there may be some terminologies that you may not know. And then lastly, this video plan is huge. How are you going to use social media to be able to, um, you know, I would recommend you get a, a, a private Twitter account so that you can send messages and send videos and practice plans and scouting reports to your team. Phase two is culture continued. You know, listen, everybody's happy until they realize that they're not playing. And, 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 but, but if you can figure out a way to create real roles for people um, and how to like exemplify the, the priorities of, of the characteristics you're looking for of effort um, and teamwork and commitment, and that's going to help you more than anything else. And that, that's where Stags is going to come in big time. The 15 drill environment, you know, once you've got these drills mastered, it's time to layer. And that's what you saw with all those uh, uneven drills. Um, the live trainings, they're, they're, you know, listen, we've got, we've got like 15 weeks of it. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm loading up with three of them per week for the first few weeks. Um, but we, we've got so much stuff to go over, and we're going to be like – really laying it on you. Phase three, you know, culture in action, peaking at the right time, learning how to make adjustments, halftime adjustments, in-game adjustments, um, film and statistical analysis. Uh, Jesse McNulty, good friends of Dave Huntley, worked with us with the, uh, with the Atlanta Blaze last year. And this guy is like, um, he, he's charted the last six years of shots in the MLL. How would you like to know about that information and how to use statistics Granted, you don't have the resources that some people have, but you do have stats and you can use them. We're going to bring him in and it's going to help you. By the way, the number one criteria for improving your shooting percentage in the MLL, get your stick to the middle. Get your stick to the middle. Alley shots are so much worse than shots when you're coming to the middle. We probably already knew this, but I'm telling you, man, if you look at the stats, and I'll, show them to, I'll share them with you later on in this, it's pretty, it's pretty wild. And it's, and you know, you, when you're thinking about your offense, you know, you got to be a little careful on trying to base it on alley shots. So what I really wanted to create here was a, a program like none other. Now we've all been to, you know, uh, a lot of different things before, but being able to have access to these webinars, libraries, documents, terminologies, the micro trainings, um, just so you know, if you guys do like do this, you can have up to four coaches in this. This is not priced on a per person basis, but rather a, a per program basis. Um, and it's open until the end of July. So I'm going to do stuff. I'm going to do trainings right through June and July. A lot of people are doing stuff with their high school teams or their programs uh, into the summer. Um, I'm bringing on awesome guests. You know, I just talked about Coach Stagnita and, and, and JC Click, but Stephen Brundage is going to do a talk. He's the, he's the Marquette head assistant. He's, a, he's really been one of the leaders in, in the development of the Pairs offense. Him and uh, Chris Bates back uh, in, in the early Princeton days have been running this forever. Dave Metzbauer um, is going to talk about early offense. Lars Tiffany, uh, you know, he and I were captains together at Brown. He's going to come on a, a few different times. Ryan Dan, he's at Penn. He's going to do a talk on the Syracuse motion offense. He's also going to jump on a bunch of our, uh, our uh, um, office hours. Andy Towers. You don't know him. He's one of the best dudes ever, but he's also the, maybe the greatest face-off guy player ever, a two-time All-American who's honestly arguably the best face-off guy at all time, has some amazing insights. Um, but I'm also going to bring Matt Schomburg on to talk about actual um, face-off development. So Towers is going to talk macro, and uh, Shami's going to talk micro. And then Bresh is going to come on and talk a little 10-man ride with us. I'm not going to get into the topics. There's a million of them, okay? Um, I've posted them. You know, you can screenshot this if you want to. Um, in the end, in the end there's, there's, there's more topics than we're going to spend time on. Um, but one of the things I want to talk about, though, is that a, a little bit different than most of the coaches' clinics you've been to. And this is what I'm shooting for. Number one, they're all going to be video-based. There's going to be, you know, a quick slide on the topic. But then it's going to be video, and it's going to be them voicing it over. I'm going to be on every single training with these guys that are, whether it's me conducting it or whether it's, you know, somebody else. And I'm going to try to ask the questions and help tie it all together. Um, if you miss a, a live training, you can come back and check it out later. It's going to be edited. 
It's going to be posted in the membership area. The word integrated is really important. And I'm still, I'm still trying to figure out exactly what I'm going to do with this. But here's what I, what I know. We all go to the, like the IMLCA or US across or whatever. And, you know, sometimes we see great talks. Maybe sometimes they're not as good. But at the end of the day, we get a ton of information. But how do you use it? I'm going to be able to, because I'm in on all of the information, I'm going to start figuring out ways to share it share the ways to utilize this information. So I, I think the integrated piece is going to be pretty unique. Um, these micro trainings, I, I just thought of like what it really is. You know, when I was at Brown, just because I took Russian lit didn't mean I really wanted to read all of Anna Karenina. So I got the cliff notes and it allowed me to, uh, I don't know, bang out a paper when I didn't have a whole lot of time. Now you guys aren't going to cut corners on your lacrosse coaching the way I might have in Russian lit. However, it's really important to be able to like, you know, listen, if we got to get something installed by tomorrow or it's because we're playing somebody that does this and we need to be able to prepare for it, you need to be able to go through something in about 10 or 20 minutes. And so I've created these instructional videos that are, whether, whether they're X's and O's, skills, how to teach a skill, or whether it's, um, uh, you know, a, a core drill. Uh, I think these micro trainings are going to be awesome. Um, Office hours, um, Hunts and I thought of this together and I was so psyched to do this with him because he's such a piece of work. But office hours is this, we're gonna, get, we're gonna have a webinar just like this where you're gonna be able to submit video and be able to have us look at it. Questions in video. I mean, how sweet is that? If you got a kid who's like, you're like, why isn't this kid scoring goals? You know, we might be able to help you. And I'm gonna get guest coaches to come on. It can be like about your scouting reports, you know, teams you're gonna play. It could be about um, your, your self-scout, just anything you want to know about. On Sunday mornings, we're going to do this. And honestly, I feel like the advantage of that is, is pretty awesome. Um, there's another interactive piece of this. We're going to use an app that you'll download on your phone that gives you ability to ask questions. I mean, you could like wake up in the middle of the night and be like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Do what, how, do I, how do I do those recoveries again from that last talk? And, and, and you could – you could send this message and you're going to get feedback back on it uh, from me and some of the people that are working with us um, from our Jam 3 team. And then we've got this video vault. And I sort of referred to this before, but this past summer, I, I hired my son just to go through high school, college, and pro games and just find examples of skills so that if you want to teach, uh, I don't know, wind up moves to your team, you can download it. You can put, post it on your private Twitter and you can say, hey, guys, this is the drill we're working on today. This is the skill we want, we want to use. When you think of the – there's about, I don't know, there's about 120 terminologies of skills. And um, we have the majority of them with many little highlight reels. Frankly, mostly of high school. I picked high school because I'm like, you know, we're dealing with high school coaches and you can teach this. But we got X's and O's. We got two-man games. Uh, we got a lot of stuff. And then the last piece is this, is this, this is a concept I had. Listen, I do this anyways. Um, I am like, I, I'm kind of, a, I, I consider myself a connector. I love nothing more than when like one friend, a friend of mine from one part of my life meets and becomes friends with one of my friends from another part of my life. And, and I want to be able to help you guys. Um, and I don't care whether it's, whether it's like, hey, I got a great player and he's not getting looks or, or whether it's, you know, like I, I really would like to meet you know, Ron Caputo, because I love the way they run their pairs offense and their Duke weave. Um, you know, look, everybody in this sport um, is in it because we're not in it. To, 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 I might make a living off it, but I'm not making the kind of money that all my classmates made when they got into uh, private equity. I can tell you that. And we're doing this for, for the passion of it and the pure love of it. And so um, I, I'm going to be able to help you guys out. I'm, I, you can email me anytime. Anybody that has kind of probably already knows that that's kind of my, my, my mentality. But let's just get into what this is all about from a pricing perspective and a value perspective. And don't let your jaw, you know, if you're reeling your jaw off the ground, just understand that, like, this is, this is my life's work. And this office hours is, like, to me, uh, an unbelievable value. When you start looking and adding it all up, the live training and the micro training of people's life's work, the office hours, live support, you know, live training, office hours, the VIP support, the videos, add it all up. 
hey, we're not charging you 18 grand, so don't worry about it. But an investment uh, of 1,900 bucks, you know, we're talking about something that's, you can't get anywhere else. But don't worry because I'm not actually charging 1,900 bucks either. Um, 997 is gonna be the price of this program. And um, listen, it's not going to be for everybody. And I get that. And I'll still, you know, if you email me, I'm sure I'll follow up with you and try to help you out in any way I can. Um, but what I really wanted to do was try to explain that, like, look, you know, I'm paying a guy a lot of money to teach me how to um, run a business. Um, we all we all have to decide what's important to us. And I think that, um, you know, in the end, this is the beta test of this program. Yeah, I know the content's going to be great, but I don't want to have too many people in this program because I want to make sure I take care of everybody. So I'm discounting it. I'm limiting the numbers and we're going to really look for coaches that have the same kind of passion that, that you can tell I have um, because we're going to have a lot to talk about. It's not going to be the right program for everybody, but for people that are like pretty fired up about learning, um, it will not disappoint. So Questions and answers. I'm happy to answer any questions right now. Um, check out, you can chat me on this um, and you can um, also email me at any time. And I would love nothing more than to be able to help you guys out um, with any kinds of information that, that you might want to have. So go ahead and chat me if there's something out there that I can help you out with. And I'm going to see if I can find my chat box here. There it is. Chat box. So uh, Jamie was saying, how do I sign up? Um, I'm going to add the link right in right now. Give me one second and I'll put that in there. Uh, I'm going to add a link in. So if you want to sign up for this, that's going to be how you do it. One more second. There. That's the link. Um, See if I can read some of these other ones. Yeah, so the, the, the cost of the annual membership or start date or a set curriculum. So, you know, the answer to that question is, is that this is going to go through the end of July. And I'm just loading up information and I'm trying to tie it together. AJ, that price is crazy good. Is this webinar recorded so I can forward it to my coaching buddies? Yes, and I will. Um, I will be sending this to you guys. You guys are all going to be able to be able to get um, uh, get a look at this. Um, I can't see some of these moves in the women's game. You know, for a women's coach, I can tell you right now, um, I'm definitely going to do this for women's lacrosse. It's just a big job, but I can tell you right now, I am working with women's with uh, Northwestern and watch them this year. They're doing a ton of pass down, pick down, cut the middle, and cycle. Um, is this applicable to Bob wanted to know, is it applicable, applicable to modified level lacrosse seventh and eighth grade? The answer is yeah. Um, uh, look, everybody's going to have a little bit of a different level. Uh, as far as the, when I say level, like level of skill, you might have to spend more time. Like I did when I started my program on, on throwing and catching on the run. And there's going to be a lot of drills on that, but I'm telling you it's philosophically, you're going to want to do, you might spend more time on two on ones and three on twos rather than five on fours or six on fives. But yes, absolutely. Um, our younger age groups, transferable to lowest level. You know, listen, I can tell you this. This, this um, program is not going to be good for a level of play in which the kids can't really catch very well. That would be a whole other program, and I might do that. But for this one in particular, um, you gotta, we, we're going to draw the line at being able to – catch and throw decently well um and we all know that there's different levels of catching and throwing but i'm talking about young kids that physically aren't really ready to catch and throw um how do you simplify these drills and concepts for players with lesser skills and ability especially in the underdeveloped areas you know if we're talking about you know 12 11 and younger um, then that's going to be a different program. If you're talking about 13 or 14, where they've got sort of a strength level to be able to do this, then I can tell you that, um, that, that we're just 
you're going to focus on, I'm, I'm doing micro trainings for the JV and, and, the, and the youth level. And, 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 and as you learn all this stuff, you just may not be able to use everything you're learning on every kid, but you're going to learn a lot. Um, how would it work for a club program with more than four coaches? Uh, you can email me on that one. Um, who's my favorite Russian novelist? <laughs> Um, yeah, it's a great question. I'm gonna have to think about that one. I forgot. I think I, I, I did. I, I read the cliff notes, but I forgot to read study up on the, uh, the authors. Um, can I quickly give him my secrets? One, two, and three, uh, you send me an email. I'll see what I can do. Um, Nick wanted to know, will all the content, uh, be provided right away or is it based on the timeline? So the reason why I'm doing all these um, micro trainings is because I want to get, I, I need to get content to everybody ASAP. Um, but you know, I, I can't do, you know, five, uh, I can't do, you know, 50, 50 presentations in, in 10 days. And so we're going to do three the first week, three the second week, two the next week, all the way through until, um, until uh, June. And then we're going to cut it back to one a week. Uh, but that said, um, the micro trainings, uh, are going to like get you through. And if you have questions or requests, um, I can certainly help on that. So um, listen, everybody, I, I just want to thank you for coming on. Um, I apologize for not getting to the questions um, quicker, um, but I am um, really fired up for this. It's going to be, I think, one of the more um, intriguing things that I could do. And um, anyways, all the best to the, on the season. And if you ever, if I can help you, please let me know. Um, good luck.